herzlich willkommen im Europasaal A um 13 Uhr. Ähm, los geht's mit dem Robert Herzig von der Firma Beyond Now und äh, mit seinem Vortrag Parkinson's Law Revisited and its Impact on Home Office. The stage is yours. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for sharing this uh, talk with me. And uh, yes, yeah, so what are we talking about? This is a book that was published in 1957. It was translated into more than 50 languages. And uh, the title of Mr. Parkinson's, who obviously was a very modest man because he called the law for himself. Um, yes, uh, it is a law. So basically, if we are looking into what is a scientific law, because there are, of course, different kinds of laws. Um, so basically, a scientific law means what? I hope that was not me. Uh, that uh, the results of, of observations uh, can be uh, used for predictions, that they can be used that uh, from a law we can say from what we've seen, from what we've uh, noticed in experiments, that can be applied for future or for other phenomena. And it could be that there is a limitation to the law. And it's possible that uh, a scientific law could be contradicted. So we might have something where we say, okay, this is not true, but it could also be that it is only like limited to some smaller area or uh, that uh, it is extended or generalized if we find out something about the future. So to make it very short, however, uh, when we are talking about Parkinson's law, uh, this is what people know. The work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. This is what people know about Parkinson's law. This is but, however, not actually what this essay is about. So basically, this, first, this is the first sentence of the book. But uh, what Mr. Parkinson was, uh, Parkinson was actually uh, writing about is, uh, I will call it pseudoscientific study about how uh, administrative work is increasing uh, and how this, uh, he had some assumptions how this comes to pass. So by uh, presenting numbers from the Royal Navy and saying, okay, while well, the actual work, the numbers of ships they had, the number of officers and men went down, the number of dock, people working in the dock went up only slightly. Uh, basically the number of officials and clerks and admiral officials rose uh, in proportional. And this is, uh, so when you look at this, when you look at this first article, it looks somewhat scientific. It, it, it's based on data, but however, uh, the conclusions that he is having is that administrative work is rising because a boss wants subordinates and he will not take a single subordinate, but rather two because he doesn't want to have a, a successor, but rather, uh, two rivals, and this is the reasoning for uh, the numbers rising. While this is hard to prove or disapprove, there's some, uh, sorry, there's a slide missing. Okay, my bad. Uh, okay, uh, I, um, sorry, I will miss out uh, on, on the quote here, but uh, let me try to present this verbally. So there's another section in this book where he, he talks about shortlisting and how to select uh, suitable candidates for a job. And uh, what he's saying there is that basically uh, what you have to do is you have to make the job at like this, that it is perfectly fitting the job only if there's a single uh, person that is appl applying for the job. And in the slide that is now missing, I'm, I'm must have made your mistake. Uh, it says, okay, for this candidate, he has to fight for decent life. He has to fight against the British boxing champion. He has to show courage and, and requirements like this so that you slim it down that only one person will apply as soon as there are more than one people applying. Basically your job ad is not uh, working correctly. And when you read this and some other chapters in the book, you will see I mean, I have a hard time to be quite honest because I don't know about the reception of the book and I don't know about the 50s. So I have no idea what, 
what was science there? I mean, fake news, uh, we have difficulties today uh, to, to distinguish, but basically I think uh, we, are, we are on the safe side if we say it's uh, pseudoscience. However, let's go back to the uh, first statement. So work is expanding. Also within the very first paragraph, there is the well-known example uh, that he is uh, quoting for how work is uh, expanding. And it's about a lady that is uh, actually doing a three minute task as he describes it. The task of sending a postcard, but she is uh, first taking like uh, an hour uh, for uh, finding the postcard, an hour to find her spectacles, uh, 30 minutes to find the address of the recipient, and then another one hour and 15 minutes for writing the card. And then finally she decides 20 minutes, okay, should I take an umbrella or not before I post the card itself? And uh, this is the best known uh, uh, metaphor for how somebody can work for extended period of time for a very small task. It's also another example actually, because how the working view and the manager view might differentiate. So basically what he is saying, she's taking the whole day, like he quotes it, actually it's only four hours and 20 minutes, not the whole day, for a single task and she feels fulfilled and feels like she has accomplished something for a task that he can do in three minutes. And this is a manager kind of view. If you would do, if you write three minutes per postcard, you would write 120, now 160 postcards uh, in a day. I don't know if ever, anybody has done it like that. But yeah, this is how work and how work is viewed might clash and uh, it's still the classical example. So anyway, uh, a little activity if I may. Can I see if everybody is capable of, we saw that already, everybody's capable of raising their hand. So for these three questions, for these three general assumptions, can I have everybody raising their hand who thinks that time is precious? So this is pretty much yeah, everybody, pretty much, pretty much everybody. Uh, do you think that uh, you should not waste your time? Okay, I still don't see a lot of hands not going up, but uh, there are at least some people. And then there's the question with Parkinson's law, do you think that work does indeed expand? Does work indeed fill out the time that you give it? Do you think that this is a fact? Okay, the numbers decrease to some degree at least. So we, we, I would say it's now about 60%. Uh, yeah, I have something to think for you. If you think the time is precious, potentially that might make it a scarce resource. I think every day when I wake up, I have a full day. I know I have a lot of things on my plate for every day. That's, that's the way it is. But I think that the more you think the time is precious, the scarce of the resource time becomes. And that might be actually a reason why uh, times are detected. Because we try to squeeze more and more things uh, into less and less time. We have, of course, much more to do. There's much more uh, offered for our free time these days. Uh, and uh, regarding wasting time, uh, well, what are you doing right now? You're investing time, okay. Basically, you're wasting time with me, or I'm wasting your time, I don't know. But uh, what is waste of time? I mean, my daughter and I have very different uh, views on this. For me, her doing her schoolwork is investing time. For her doing schoolwork is definitely a waste of time. For her watching Netflix, guess what? You get the picture. Okay, but in any way, so as I think I have shown with the ridiculous examples, we may rightfully assume, first of all, what Parkinson's law is not Parkinson's law. And the observation that works expands uh, can be a thing, but it's definitely not the scientific law. But I think for our base assumption, it is a thing. So we can agree uh, it does exist and we can observe it. But given the two uh, assumptions above, I think uh, a lot of people are aware that if we give people a lot of time, then they will use up this time, will make use of the time. 
but we might sometimes jump to the wrong conclusion. And as it is a topic, and as it is a thing uh, in uh, Agile, uh, with Agile working, we actually have uh, something to combat Parkinson's law. Please shout out, please feel free to shout out, what do we use for time boxing exactly? So the time box is uh, our way of combating to, to, to waste time, to, 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 um, to lose uh, ourselves in tasks, to reduce gold plating whatsoever. And uh, for the time box, well, there are always time boxes. I already mentioned before, uh, there is the work day. It's a very natural time box, no matter what you do, no matter what method of working you are having, there's a scrum sprint, there is uh, the project duration. Uh, time boxes are there whether you want it or not. The only thing that is, uh, and that's a big difference is how fixed or how flexible are you with your time boxes? So the uh, contrasting method for working with time boxes would be like, uh, to-do lists. And if we compare this, the big difference is that uh, in the time box, we have this clear limit. Okay, this task is going to take us this long. Uh, and in the to-do list, we are working on the task until it is finished. And uh, basically, uh, the time box gives us, of course, more planability because we already know in advance how it will work out. Uh, on the to-do list, uh, the advantage is, of course, that if the task takes longer, it takes longer. That's how it is. We, we, we cannot see the future. And with the time box, of course, and this is the main reason why we are using it, uh, we re reduce the gold plating. And uh, while with the uh, to-do list, we have the reduced uh, uh, predictability, we do have the advantage that most likely uh, these tasks are finished. And uh, the only risk we are having is that if to-do lists grow and grow and grow because we don't stop them, the tasks are not being done because they fall below. Then again, uh, agilists say, if a task is not being done, it's probably not that important anyway. So it's not an issue. However, uh, the big challenge is uh, how much time to allot for a task. And it's not an either or, probably you're using both applications. It's not, this is Scrum, this is Kanban or something. Uh, you're going to have your list of things to work through. And uh, the key question here remains, and this is now with Parkinson's law again, uh, what do we do if the time allotted is wrong? How do we react? Because uh, what if we give it too much time or too little time? Okay, so, we did then a little experiment uh, with me. I mean, my colleague, David, over there, yes, uh, who supported me in uh, setting this up. And uh, it was his idea, actually. Uh, he had a little game. You don't know, I don't know whether you know this game when software engineers draw requirements and then somebody draws this requirement. So it's about communication, about how much you miss in communication. And this is actually uh, an extension of this. The game is called Meisterwerke. And it is one player describing the other player a picture. And the thing is, you don't know what the questions will be that will be asked. So you don't know the 10 requirements uh, that uh, will be put there, they, they, they are covered. You describe the picture and only after that you will find out if you describe the things that were important or not. And we use this for a little time box. So what it did is here, uh, as you can see, this was working without the time box. I think every picture took like 10 to 15 minutes. So basically, uh, other than showing that we are not the drawing experts, yeah, you can see uh, eight out of 10 and seven out of 10 questions have been answered. And uh, the resemblance if between the original and the picture, I mean, it's okay for people who cannot draw. I think we did a pretty good job. I think whoever explained it did also a good job. Then, what we tried to do is, okay, now we're working with a time box. And uh, again, it's pseudoscience, it's not real, but uh, I hope that at least the data we have here or showing here is correct. Uh, we reduced the time box to two minutes and we got a very interesting result. So basically uh, the pictures now definitely do not match that much anymore. One can see that there has been due to the time pressure, some things omitted. 
And on the left-hand side, as I said, that's the data where we're not sure whether it was accurately recorded. We only have now two out of 10. While on the other hand, with a two minute time box and the game actually has this hourglass that's one, hour, one minute 30 or something. So 90 seconds, that's the duration. So we are here a little bit above the game duration. We got a seven uh, out of 10. And if you now look at this, like uh, from the timing perspective, this was uh, 12 minutes versus two minutes. We got the same output. So one time. On the other time, when probably this was now the person giving out the requirements a little bit stressed and everything, uh, we have a catastrophic result. It was totally okay. But in any case, then we tried to do it a little further to, 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 to prove a point. And we have only one drawing of this, but we tried what happens if we go with the time box to 30 seconds. And yes, the Result is very expected. You see that uh, no points have been reached. Uh, we didn't get a single, I mean this, yeah, in 30 seconds it was really, really stressful to get this somehow right. Okay, <clears throat> so time boxing, time boxes, you know the risk. Uh, while we know Parkinson's law exists, while we know that we are trying uh, to address it, uh, there is, uh, when we are, how, how, how are we uh, approaching this? Uh, there is a risk that uh, we actually make work worse. Work will need its time, that's a good thing with the to-do list, uh, but there is also a risk uh, that uh, by assuming that Parkinson's law is in place when it's not, we might also uh, make a situation worse than it originally is. So basically what I'm uh, having here as an example is that our scrum team or one of our scrum teams, uh, yeah, so you know that the forecast and the commitment have been uh, replaced. So we said, okay, it makes no sense to have a commitment because this means in the time box, the developers commit that they will be done. Uh, what happened is this, this, this change in the Scrum Guide, I mean, uh, it has been uh, some years, I don't know exactly how long, was not well communicated to everybody. And uh, then I had this project manager of a different company, uh, not with us, and he said, okay, I want to have a commitment. And he insisted on this still. And uh, what happened was, of course, if you need to commit, what you need to do is, you need to estimate lower. You need to, you, you cannot do the same, you cannot take the same risk as with a forecast. So in, in effect, this team did get slower visibly because they could not uh, commit to the same things that they could forecast to. So by trying to make things faster, then of course, and if you push, if you produce force on something, if you try to move something with force, then uh, that's a potential reaction. Once they committed to less, they hardly uh, overachieved anymore. So in a way, by thinking that Parkinson's law was in place and thinking that, uh, okay, we, we, we have to accelerate things, uh, what, what, what actually happened is that uh, Parkinson's law kicked in only afterwards, most likely, and uh, uh, the situation definitely got worse for this team. So, so the team uh, produced less uh, than it did before. So that's pretty much everything to Parkinson's law, I have to say. So there's the second thing. I hope that I don't overstretch here myself. Uh, what does this mean now for home office? Um, so basically the game change for home office was the pandemic. Uh, people have been doing, uh, home office before the pandemic, but it has not been on that scale. And with the pandemic now, uh, I think I, I read somewhere 16% uh, of employees, I think that's a US number, but 16% of US uh, for, of employees are quoted, they will not work if they cannot work from home office anymore. So they rather choose a different employer. Uh, and uh, so 
is changed. Uh, so let's get here a feel from the room. Uh, can somebody tell me for the first question, who can say, please raise your hand, I'm more productive when I'm working from home office. Okay. 50% interesting, really interesting. Okay, and uh, who wants to say at least want to work part-time from home? Okay, that's pretty much 90, 95, maybe 100%. Okay, so the first question I have to ask you is, how come? How can it be that the office is keeping you from working? How can, I mean, I'm trying to work good in the home office, but how can it be that you're more productive at home than in the office? What's wrong with your offices? That you can achieve more from home than in the office. I, I, I have serious doubts about that. I mean, as hard as I'm working, the best I can do is I can be as productive in the home office as in the office. If somebody sees it differently, I mean, I've heard all kinds of talk, so uh, I'm not disturbed that often. I have, uh, 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 it, it's more silent, I can more focus or something like that. Uh, yes, perhaps, but uh, I think that uh, there is a trade off that most people, I mean, it depends of course on the job, are not aware of. So I think there's a, a so there's a cost that we are paying that we don't know. And this is basically, so why are we doing now? Uh, uh, why, why, how can we make working from home uh, work? How does this work? If we say uh, it's unlikely to be better. Uh, the main reason was of course, before with the pandemic, it was easy. We had to. So before we have people not working, it's great to have them working at home. And now, of course, uh, yes, now, as everybody saw, so we want to. I mean, it's basically a five to 10 or 15% pay raise because we don't have to commute. So it's, it's less time. Nobody was like, nobody said, okay, if you're working from home, we cut your uh, wage because, so I understand and I do want to work from home, but, uh, and that's the thing here, and this, this is where uh, we come back to Parkinson's law and where we come back to uh, actually, actually conflict management, there is a hidden cost. So we don't know what is not working when we are working from home. We don't see necessarily, we see what we achieve more. And to be quite honest, uh, my working council didn't allow me to check. Because the first thing I was when our developers, everybody said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm much more productive. I'm not so much disturbed. What I wanted to go is go to our code base and see if I can see, uh, uh, if I can like measure uh, productivity in lines of code. I know it's a dump measure, don't get me wrong, but it's something that you could look at. I, I was just curious, but my work council told me I can't do that. Uh, we are not allowed to do it. So I don't have any data on that. Sorry for that. Anyway, but they allowed me that I can quote that. They, they, they forbade it. Um, and in any case, uh, so we don't know what's not working. We do see, however, and, and it's too early to tell. So that's why I call it also pseudoscientific. It's too early for us to tell where uh, the issues are coming from, but we do see there are issues. So we have a higher turnover rate. Uh, it might have tons of, tons of reasons. And I don't say that uh, home, uh, remote work is the key reason, but uh, I assume that it uh, plays a role in it. And uh, again, so uh, for Agilis, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm shocked because I remember like uh, three years ago when I was like working with distributed teams and I said, I have some people in Romania, I have some people uh, here in Graz, please, can we have, can we make use of a digital scrum board? I had a scrum master telling me, we cannot do this. We lose so much by using a digital scrum board. We, 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 we have to use this haptical experience, how important it is to move the cards. It's a totally different thing. People will be demotivated. Uh, two years later, I mean, all the scrum boards are gone. We are not talking about co-location anymore. We are, we are saying, okay, how can we retain the people in the field if we don't keep them, if we don't give them home office, they will stop working. Uh, so the playing field has totally changed. I don't think that the agile values have. I think that uh, it's okay for me to reassess, 
It's okay for me to say that we have a different speed of working, that we have a different way of working. I don't need 38 hours or 38 and a half hours of work. I'm fine with 30 hours as well or whatever it is, but we should be somewhat, uh, um, how should I say, honest about it. I understand that I don't want to go to the company if I don't have to, if I can save two, four hours of drive. Hey, great. Uh, but on the other hand, and uh, this is the model that I'm showing here, uh, Coburn described this uh, osmotic communication and the arc second to say how much effort is it to communicate uh, a piece of information to somebody else. And he said that already by how you see the people, whether they are watching each other or whether they're sitting in the same room with specs to each other is already a communication loss. You already lose information. Uh, if you have a wall in between and I have to look around uh, it changes the flow of information. Uh, it will be slower. We will not get this much. Even, uh, yeah, we covered scrum boards already, but uh, this bus length communication, this is actually a technique to interrupt communication. If you have a person that is targeted from all sides and he has too much communication because everybody wants something from him, what he said in his book, uh, and I'm also sorry because I'm missing the reference. It's uh, the cooperative game by Coburn, where this is taken from. I must have not the last version on here. Sorry for that. Uh, the uh, bus line communication principle is the cone of silence. So this means uh, you want to have him less communication. Make sure that he's farther than a school bus away. Set him on a different floor or just five rooms away. People will not walk this distance, they will stop communicating with this person and it will give him more time. And uh, now let's do the math. Home office, how often do you not reach somebody? How, how does this work out? Uh, did, did the amount of anybody's meeting go up uh, during home office? Do you have the feeling, yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but, uh, I think that that is an indicator uh, for uh, that this is not working or not working as good as it as, uh, as we think it is. But on the other hand, there are advantages that everybody wants to have, and that's fine. Um, so now I get the real problem. There's something wrong here. Okay, this will be now a real challenge. Um, I will have to uh, go for the last three slides and I can't even read that. So, um, okay, I will try to do extempore out of my head. Uh, obviously I did this uh, under Parkinson's law and uh, my time box was over. So uh, now it's a technical error, sorry for that. In any way, uh, so the key uh, items, and I hope you can see it on the presentation later on, uh, the key item for conflict resolution and home office is now that uh, because we have more overhead, because we have to communicate, uh, it's more difficult and there are more misunderstandings. Because of this, it is, it is likely that uh, we are going slower. So we did the agile methods to go faster. Now we're going slower. It's acceptable because there's no reason to be, if everybody else is going 100, why do we need to go 130? But uh, with this new way of working, there are more uh, risks, there's more conflict, more potential for conflict. And uh, it's likely that uh, this, 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 this communication overhead has to be like uh, put into the, uh, into our progress somehow. So, so we are going slower, we have more uh, issues, we have to address this. However, uh, yes, on the other hand, uh, there is the alternative going back to the office and being more productive again. We don't want that. So we try to uh, resolve the conflicts, we try to overplay it, we try to uh, not touch it. And uh, this results uh, in the end that uh, we have problems that we wouldn't have if we wouldn't use home office. So that's, that's the baseline. And now, uh, as we keep on wanting to work it, we resolve these problems. But I assume, again, I don't have data for that, but my assumption is 
that a lot of this conflict resolution that has to be done remote is also uh, happening only very superficially. So it's not really, I mean, I don't know, did you ever have the feeling that you had a big argument, uh, something uh, was not going right, and then you just hang up and that's it. And uh, what's the difference to the situation when you're in the office, when you had this big argument, this hanging up, it's not about having or not having the argument, it's about what happens afterwards. If I have an argument with my coworker, and then I have to sit in the very same room with him for three more hours, and I see him like this and uh, aggravated, and uh, maybe I have, I can use this feedback. Maybe I can make use of this, and a lot of miscommunication that happens does not occur because this feedback loop is enabling me that I can react to what I did. I, I might not do it right away, but at least I will get, because of this feedback, uh, a potential uh, chance to rectify the situation at some time. And this feedback loop is basically missing. So we don't have this feedback loop, so we have more conflict. We don't resolve the conflict. We stop fighting. It may be even that we have less conflicts. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure about that anymore, but uh, at the beginning, when, when, when I set out to do my talk, I was, uh, before I looked, I was sure that we're not fighting anymore at all. It, it's, it's like peace, but uh, again, no, it's not that way. But in any case, I think that the resolution of uh, issues uh, is not taking place like it's used to. The feedback loop is definitely missing. And uh, that would be then basically my takeaways because uh, we all do know that um, if people are frustrated, if they are uh, not very much motivated to work, the first thing that will happen is again Parkinson's law. Work will take the time that it can, whatever it is, you will not get people motivated, overachieving. And uh, the uh, key thing about uh, is this, potential consequences then is of course that uh, you might lose, have a higher turnover and uh, the numbers for this are something, the costs for somebody leaving your company might be up to twice the annual salary. So this, this is the thing that we don't see. We have the higher turnover rates. We don't know where they are relating to. There might be a lot of different things, but uh, by us trying to say, okay, because of Parkinson's law, we are trying to get things faster. We are trying to get set, set shorter time boxes. We're trying to do like working from home is working the same like working from uh, the office. We're trying to get the same results. Uh, it might be difficult to avoid these risks and these costs. Thanks and sorry for the presentation. I'm, I'm feeling really like Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, are there any questions? Thank you. Um, you mentioned you are working with distributed teams, Romania and Austria. Um, did you um, experience similarities also with distributed teams as with home office, as you described now? I mean, uh, I was working with teams. This was prior to the pandemic and uh, we had difficulties at that time because the norms were just different. I'm working with a distributed team with a customer now, but that's not the same company. So uh, it, 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 it's a somewhat different setup. I do say that uh, what definitely helps overall is if everybody's working distributed, some things are working better than they used to work with partly colored colorated teams and partly distributed teams. So uh, this is definitely uh, something that, and we are finding new solutions. So don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of remote work. So we are finding ways, we are finding solutions to work around this, but I'm also a fan of working collaboratively and uh, I would not say one over the other. Yeah, it's, it's, hi, Matthias here. 
uh, thank you very nice very nice talk I enjoyed it uh, very much um, so um, I, I I think you're you're definitely onto something and uh, we did something like virtual coffee talks um, we are going one time uh, a week in the office and meet there and and try to mitigate that a little bit what would you recommend uh, doing to maybe maybe get a little bit uh, from from the staff back? I mean, the things that you said, virtual coffee talk and so are definitely uh, something. And I, I, I don't know, we had like our scrum master sitting there. So uh, he is the one who's active on that part. But uh, we, we tried like this virtual city meeting, meetups and, and, and things like that. But that's, that's, that's helping and, that, and it's attempt to do something. I think that a hybrid model might still be uh, something that helps. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not for totally remote work. Hybrid model, I think, is, is the easiest way to, to, to get the best out of uh, both worlds. If it's not possible, uh, then, uh, yeah, retreats and trying, trying to get the people at least together once every three months. I mean, we did this before, before uh, when we worked with customers from abroad. We, we tried to get the people to, to, to touch each other, not touch each other, but, you know, get into touch. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we have some questions uh, yeah, in the chat, uh, there's another one. Question from the chat, if this is okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Please, yeah. Um, Robert, can you please reiterate how Parkinson's law is connected to harder um, conflict resolution in a home office, home office setting? The key here is from, from uh, we are assuming we should, some, some, some tasks might take longer than what uh, they should take. And we're trying to shorten the time box. We, 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 we it's, 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 the key sentence on the slide would be, it's harder to assess whether we have a case of Parkinson's law or not. So uh, what it is, is uh, it's not that Parkinson's law is more or less uh, available in the home office or, or uh, it, it's uh, there, but uh, it's harder to say from the outside whether we do have it. So I think every project manager, every PO knows if things are not working the way they're, they, 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 you expect them to work, then you have in the back of your mind that that might have to do with Parkinson's law. But in the home office, it might not be that easy to say. It might not be easy. And I don't mind, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's okay to work fast, but I think the higher risk is to think you have to do with Parkinson's law when you don't. So, so I, I think that when we try to speed up, when, 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 when we try to crush times, uh, there's a higher risk uh, that, that we get unsatisfied people. Uh, and it, it's really hard to say why, why are things sometimes not getting done. Um, thank you very much. I want to um, agree with Matthias and thank you very much for this really inspiring and great talk. You're really addressing a very uh, everyday's problem that affects all of us. Um, I will give a short context since I was the only one raising his hands, okay, on the, on the question. Um, we funded our company in 2018, 19, and we've started the company completely remote. We've had people doing vacation this year in the Lofoten, in Egypt, um, some of Mallorca, I think, so everywhere. And I take away from your talk that the conflict resolution might be something that we're missing out. And I'll really take care of that tomorrow. So thank you for that. And you said that you are used to discuss this with people. I, like, I would like to discuss that with you because I appreciate the approach to um, say there might be issues that we don't know, but I haven't seen that yet besides the conflict resolution issue. Is there any other issues that you found out or saw? Um, burnout numbers are rising. So this goes hand in hand with uh, burnout numbers are rising with home office and uh, but yeah uh, mm -hmm. and as I said conflict resolution I think that this is a key point for turnover but there mm -hmm. might be other reasons as well mm -hmm. so. okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you so are there any questions left we have we have two questions 
Are there any questions in the chat? No. Simon? No. No. Okay. Ladies first. Or? Yeah, I look. Hi, uh, Luca Petek here from PwC. Um, just want to make a comment. I think it was an interesting um, session. What I was thinking is what even in the home office, for example, we have more time available for actual work because we cut off some things like commuting, like um, office, I don't know, um, logistics and so on. But I would, I would say that that time gets filled with other topics and extra meetings, like you mentioned, and so on. So in my view, the, the, the Parkinson's law stays intact eh, in that sense. What I would be interested in is to see if we actually reduce the work to six hours a day, four days a week, for example, how that changes and if the law then still actually, um, you know, can get validated or not by that. Because then you would actually prove that even by reducing the time available, um, you can get the same work or more work done or so on. And that would actually, you know, prove or disprove the law of, of this elasticity of time, actually, that get filled with other things. So. I, I didn't say as a, that. As a but, question, no, I'm not saying you said that. Yeah, I, I said no, no, I would be no, interested in hearing that. What I say is, if if we were to say if we work six hours now uh, because of Parkinson's law, we might get the same work done. I mean, some people actually say that that could be the case, but I don't know. But basically, it would mean that we have two extra hours that we are not making use of. Uh, I I said that because of home office, if this is related to home office, we are slower, but we don't admit it. So I said, we are actually getting less work done, most likely in the home office because of the nature of not working together. And uh, if everybody accepts this, like, like, like the speed limit, if everybody's playing by the same rules, that's not the problem. Whether you spend the time that you save with the commute for doing work at home or whether you watch Netflix or whether you do something different, this work, this time never counted to your official work. Most people commute on their free time. So it's the free time that they get back and they can do with it whatever they want. But the work at home, the assumption is that it is at most the same speed as it would be in the office. I mean, there might be some exceptions, but I think most of the time you're working the same speed. And uh, then of course, sometimes there might be some distractions. There is the problem of, uh, the communication, the remote communication, and this makes things slower. So my assumption is that whatever it is, we are slower, but if everybody is slower, I mean, the target we are trying to reach is just the, if, if it's the new norm, the new way of working, we don't have to be faster. It's okay for us to say, we are now producing our work with, I mean, for knowledge work, it's total nonsense anyway, but let's say we are now producing with 90% than before the pandemic. If that's the way, if everybody's playing by the same rules, it's not a problem. But right now there are people who are saying, okay, yeah, we're working better from home and I seriously doubt that. I do have an additional question. Um, so what would be your, in your opinion, the way to break Parkinson's law? Parkinson's law? Sorry, I didn't get What would be your, ah, sorry, I can't speak up too much because my voice is not so good. But um, what would be in your opinion, the solution to break the law? Because in, if I you may- don't have to. You don't have to break the law. As I said, it's not a scientific law. The time box is already the right tool. What I warn, what I really warn is, and this is the, the, the difficulty, the time box is the right tool if you use it appropriately. We already have this, uh, if you say, okay, there's the risk that uh, the project will be delayed, work will not finish, people have been watching for this. So whenever a project from myself comes to an end, I watch does do we significantly slow down and I know, okay, if there's not that much work, then maybe, so this, 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 you can watch it, but it's much harder to watch it. And the time box, the, the deadline, this, this is a sufficient tool. You don't need anything else for that, but you have to be very careful. And this is what I'm saying, because everybody knows it and thinks it's a law. Then uh, sometimes we get uh, a wrong output by uh, putting too much pressure by trying to to overcome the effects of this law, we sometimes get uh, not what we want, the result that we want. So basically what you're suggesting is a change of mindset. That depends where, where you start off from. I think there are, there are probably a lot of uh, people who have the right mindset and say, okay, uh, we try to use it uh, with, 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 with caution and with 
so the awareness of this law means does not mean that everybody's abusing it. There's only a high risk that some people might try to uh, overdo it because they are afraid of this effect and they might overcompensate. Thank you very much. The time is over. Uh, thank you very much for that inspirational talk. Thank you for the discussion. Big applause to Robert once again. Yeah.